Hello, everyone. Welcome to New Hope United Methodist Church. I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us for our online worship this Sunday. Um, I'm on the road this week. Um, I'm doing my best to, to stay safe, um, and I will be back um, in Enid next week. Uh, this week, we actually have uh, someone who is filling in on the uh, for our in-person worship, and um, I would love to be able to get you all that sermon as well, uh, but for, for our online worship, um, I, you've got me preaching. I'm going to be uh, just giving you a little bit of a, a shorter sermon this week. Um, our scripture for today is from the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promises that he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The Son of God, the righteous King born of a virgin, Prince of Peace, who has brought peace to all the world and whose kingdom will reign forever. I'm, of course, talking about someone that I hope that we all know very well. Augustus Caesar. Yeah, it's true. Augustus Caesar crowned the first emperor of Rome after his uncle's murder had brought down the Roman Republic, held all of these titles before Jesus was born. Now, of course, he gave most of these titles to himself, um, and he, he um, kind of forced the, the Senate's hand into appointing his, his adopted father, Julius Caesar, as, as a god um, and making himself the, the son of a god. Um, and the, the, the born of a virgin thing is really suspect because he had an older sister and no one ever made that claim about her. She certainly wasn't making it about herself. Um, so I don't know how people were expected to believe that. Uh, but the one title, the Prince of Peace, this title he earned. You see, Rome was founded in war, raised in conflict and brought down by murder. But out of the ashes, Augustus amassed so much power that he, he temporarily ended war because there was no one left to stand against him. He did something that would have seemed impossible. He brought peace to the entire known world. Now today, we call this peace the, the Pax Romana, um, and it has come to mean a, a false peace, one maintained by power and oppression. And indeed, all of Judea at the time was under Roman rule. Now, Rome had gotten very good at ruling by this point. They, they would go in with an army, conquer land, set up a puppet government, collect taxes, and promise peace. And any time that violence erupted, they would quickly and ruthlessly quash it down. It was peace, but it was peace without justice. And all the while, as I said last week, the Jewish people were praying for a Messiah to come and liberate them. And the little children would tug at their parents' robes and say, when is the Messiah coming? And the parents would respond, any day now, my child, any day. And into this world of expectation, a baby was born. In our text for today, I realized that, that Christmas combines two things. Um, we as a society don't really much care for combining waiting and justice. 
We, we hate putting these things together so much that we even have, we even have a phrase that, that puts it into a, a, a simple saying about how much we hate combining waiting and justice. Justice delayed is justice denied. But here in the first chapter of Luke, we have Mary praising God with thanksgiving that she is part of the things that are happening because through her pregnancy, God is coming into the world to scatter the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, to bring down the powerful from their thrones and lift up the lowly, to fill the hungry with good things and send the rich away empty. Yes, it's been said that there is justice in the womb, justice that is preparing to come out into the world. And I wonder, when the angel visited Mary, did, did she know what to expect? Do we, in this season of Advent, know what to expect? What do you want for Christmas? It was this question that Santa asked my little brother the first time that he was brave enough to sit in Santa's lap. I want a Razor scooter, Dylan confidently replied. Oh, ho, ho, you know, Santa laughed and he explained that this item was very popular that year and that his elves were working very hard to make enough, but he couldn't guarantee anything. He often did this with items that were expensive or hard to find. And after the picture was taken, my brother happily hopped away, still confident that Santa would pull through. His faith remained steadfast throughout the Christmas season, and his excitement was exactly what you would expect from a six-year-old boy with way too much energy. So Christmas Eve came, and on the way home for church, um, way home from the, from the church service, Dylan and I somehow managed to convince our parents that we should get to open a present before we went to bed. I'm not sure how we did that. We, have, we had never had that tradition before, um, but somehow on that short drive home, we convinced them uh, that every other kid got to open a gift on Christmas Eve, uh, so we ought to as well. And as we gathered around the Christmas tree, my brother spied a long, thin box wrapped in shiny red foil, hidden deep behind the lower branches. Could this be his scooter? Maybe Santa couldn't make enough, so Mom and Dad had found one at the store. He seized the package in a flash, paper flying, box ripping, heart pounding. He grabbed the present and jumped to the feet, jumped to his feet, holding it in the air for all to see. Pajamas. Disappointment clouded his face. How could life be so unfair? Now, pajamas are the perfect gift for Christmas Eve. You can actually use them unlike a scooter at nearly midnight with snow on the ground. Still, he was so upset because in the end, he got something other than what he was expecting. He got what he needed instead of what he wanted. What do you want for Christmas? It's way too easy for us to get caught up in expecting the wrong thing. <laughs> we do it all the time at Christmas, just like my, my brother so many Christmases ago. But the expectations have always been wrong, even since that very first Christmas. See, in, in Jesus' day, there, there was no separation of the religious and political. Uh, it couldn't be done then, just as it honestly can't be done now. And nowhere is this more clear than in the Jewish expectation for a Messiah from God, a king with great power who would raise up an army, wage war on the Romans, and kick them out once and for all, establishing Jerusalem as the center of world power. And this is the great irony of Christmas. They wanted a mighty king, but they got a little baby. They wanted a stately palace, but they got a lowly manger. 
They wanted a military warrior, but they got a crucified teacher. They wanted someone like Augustus, but they got someone like God. Yes, Caesar can bring peace, but not justice. Under Caesar, everyone was on one currency. There was one law, a new system of roads and trade and cultural exchange. There was unity and there was peace, but there was also poverty, slavery. Women were property. There was no justice, no hope. The most powerful and wealthy were able to continue to become more powerful and more wealthy, while the poor became poorer and the sick became sicker. But there was peace, but it was false, a cruel injustice. It's surprising how familiar all this is. In the United States, to all appearances, we resemble Rome. There's rampant inequality. And we have sexism and racism ingrained in our society in many ways that that many of us, including myself, are blind to the way that they operate on a day-to-day basis. We We maintain power and security through a massive military. We've exploited the poverty of other nations for our own benefit, and we've done this by choice as members of a democracy. And we've chosen this destructive program over and over again. And I think that this is because we have a tendency to prefer Caesar over Christ. And don't get me wrong, (laughs) I think it's a a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Caesar brings power, and, and power is immediate. It doesn't depend on the transformation of hearts and minds. It doesn't depend on hope for the future. It's here, now. And we hate waiting. We hate waiting for Christmas. We hate waiting for justice. We hate waiting for peace. But Rome never lasts. The greatest lie that Augustus Caesar told about himself, perhaps in some ways even greater than his claim to divinity, was that his kingdom would last forever. Rome's system relied on exploitation, exploiting the labor of low-skilled workers, exploiting women's bodies, natural resources, and the environment. And exploitation always leads to resentment, and resentment always leads to resistance. And praise God that someone like Mary is always there to lead the charge. Neither weak nor passive, the Mary in our text today is strong and active. She stands and delivers a speech that could easily be called a political manifesto. When she proclaims God's justice on the nations, the scary thing is she means it. She speaks a word of judgment, yes, judgment against the proud, the powerful, and the rich. And I think that this should at least cause us to stop and think about what it means to be a Christian in the most proud, powerful, and rich country in the world. Mary believes in God's justice so strongly that she declares it in the past tense as though it had already been accomplished, and yet she is still willing to wait for it, to await the justice in the womb. In an episode of uh, my, uh, well, my wife and I's, my wife and I, my wife, my, in an episode of the, of our favorite TV show, that me and my wife, you know what I'm trying to say, the college sweethearts, um, Marshall and Lily of How I Met Your Mother are expecting a baby. They paint the child's room, they baby-proof the house, they take birthing classes and buy a stroller, and in the final weeks as they're sleeping, they wake suddenly to an alarm. Lily panics, confused and frightened, as Marshall stands up, walks into the baby's room, 
reaches into the crib and pulls out a swaddled megaphone that he had wired to go off every three hours to prepare himself for the disrupted sleep patterns of parenthood. It's a testament to just how far parents are willing to go to prepare for a new baby. But it also goes to show you that awaiting a baby is not a passive endeavor. We have to prepare, and that's what the season of Advent is about. The coming of Christmas calls us to prepare our hearts for the kingdom of God, a kingdom in which Jesus, not Caesar, is on the throne. Christmas calls us to bring light to the dark places in the world, to the places where hope has been lost. It calls us to bring justice to places of injustice, it disturbs the peace of our modern-day Rome. In this season of preparation, we are called to be midwives for justice, to help it come into the world, to live into God's kingdom here on earth as much as possible, knowing that one day we will experience it fully. When we bring the love of God into the world, it spreads. It builds something truly beautiful. What do you want for Christmas? Amen.